Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this regular scheduled meeting of the Beaver Creek City Council. This being the first meeting of City Council for 2023. So welcome. May we have a roll call, please? Council Member Adams. Here. Council Member Bales. Here. Council Member Curran. Here. Council Member Dewar. Here. Council Member Schwartz. Here. Vice Mayor Garcia. Mayor Stone. Here. Do I have a motion to excuse? Motion to excuse Vice Mayor Garcia. Second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. I would now like to turn it over to Council Member Curran for the pledge. Please. Thank you, Your Honor. If you'd all rise, please. I have the pledge. To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Lord, we pray for wisdom, for strength, for courage to do what is right and good for all of our citizens. And we put the interest of others above our own. May we act with love for the common good. And we be good neighbors, recognizing your image in every person we meet. We just pray for a moment of silence for counsel, for guidance and direction in this new year. Amen. Thank you. All right, we have a, an agenda before us this evening. Any changes? Well, we approve the agenda, Your Honor. Second. second. I have a motion and a second to approve the agenda as submitted. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. All right, we have the approval of the minutes from the December 12th regular session meeting. Any comments? Move to approve. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve the minutes for December 12th as submitted. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. First on the agenda is public hearing, PC 22-9. PC 22-9. Notice is hereby given that a public hearing will be held at Beaver Creek City Hall, 1368 Research Park Drive, Beaver Creek, Ohio, 45432 on January 9th, 2023 at 6 p.m. for the purpose of correcting the zoning designation of those properties listed in the public notice. Ordinance 23-1, an ordinance amending the zoning designation on several parcels on the zoning map to remove multi-zone property designations. Thank you. Mr. Burkett. Good evening, Mayor, members Good of the evening. City Council. Uh, fortunately, I get to, to be tonight both the applicant and the staff representation, so we'll get a two for one. Oh, no, that's not allowed. No. <laughs> I can have Sandra be the applicant there you if, go. if we'd like. <laughs> um, the case you have before you, in, in, while well, it's being pulled up, it, what happened was in 2021, we did a, uh, we converted the way we uh, display and catalog the zoning map from a from a straight visual base or a, a straight um, uh, picture based map and converted into GIS as we we're um, you know integrating in GIS into all the uh, departments. So we converted that to a GIS map. And one thing that we found was there's several properties in the city because the parcel lines don't necessarily match up with the lines of the zoning. There's multiple properties in the city that have two different zoning uh, designations, part of it being agricultural, part of it being residential, um, was the most often that we had found. So um, early last year, we had started the process of, at of reaching out to several property owners um, that had those multiple designations to uh, just get their f uh, feedback on uh, and see what their interest was in the city taking forward an application to get rid of some of those um, multiple zoning designations. So we sent it out to, a, to about 25, 26 people. We actually heard back from 21 that were in favor of it. One person didn't want to do it. And a few that you know, we, we tried several times, we sent letters out um, and we attempted phone calls and Sandra actually went out to the, the people at their house and, and tried to make physical contact with them. But we just couldn't get a hold of three people. So what we have here this evening are the 21 that we did get authorization from to, uh, to go through this process. Uh, seen here is the map of the properties that we're discussing this evening. 
Um, a lot of them are up north in the, um, the, the large development just north of Lance Road. Um, one is um, St. Luke's property, um, a few along Creekside Drive, and then one is actually our public service building that's out in Alpha, a part of it zoned I-1 and a part of it zoned O-1, so we wanted to bring that, and we wanted to, to correct that on ours too. Um, so again, each of the properties had a mix of zonings. Um, this could have been caused by just, again, they were done over the years. It was done from a graphical standpoint of just place, uh, using AutoCAD and an underlying parcel map. And so now we combine that so it's all one parcel using the parcel data. So we found in, uh, in instances in the past when property owners and contacts and wanted to sell the property or wanted to refinance the property, banks had a really hard time giving them lending because they needed it to be either all agricultural, all zone, or all residential, and, and it, it just was a headache. So we've actually taken a few properties over the years through for them for that purpose. So this one, it, it, it's a win-win. It helps the city kind of get rid of those anomalies on the map, but also in the future it'll help the homeowners um, should they want to sell, refinance, or, or go through any of that. One thing I wanted to point out, there's no none of the proposed changes in the ordinance this evening was where we introdu introduced a, a completely separate zoning um, designation, so it wasn't like one was split A1 and R1A, and we also just brought in a B2 or something like. So, of the part of the properties that are proposed to go through this, at least a portion of the property is is zoned currently what we're proposing to incorporate the entire parcel. Um, and this is just an example, uh, one down. Um, I believe this is one. Uh, this is on Dayton Senior Road. Um, it actually sits north of Dayton Senior Road by a couple hundred feet. Um, where they, uh, th on the left, you see this existing zoning, and the parcel line is the dark, uh, the thicker black line, and, and a portion of it is R1A and a portion A1. So, what we did was look, and since it's majority A1 now, we're proposing to just uh, convert the whole thing to A1. And we did that, and that's with, I mean, there's several parcels. I can go through them all, but it, it's just the same thing with all of the parcels where, like, a, a stub is R1A, so we're just bringing the whole thing to A1. But, I took it through Planning Commission. The only change uh, that came about at Planning Commission was the Southfield Park. Um, it was, uh, we proposed it to go R1A. It's Beaver Creek City owned, um, and the, the neighbors preferred us to take it to A1, and it really didn't make a difference to us uh, either way, because there's no intent uh, at this time to subdivide it. And if that were ever an intent, it would have to go through several processes in the, in the future, with, but there's nothing on no, nothing on any radar that we'd ever want to develop that anyway. So there wasn't a problem going from R1A to A1 on that one. But Planning Commission and Planning Staff recommend approval of the 21 zoning changes that are found in your ordinance. Uh, and I'll be happy to any, answer any questions following public input. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, this is a public hearing. If there's anyone present this evening that would like to address council on this uh, on this. Uh, Ordinance is what it is. Uh, please come forward. Seeing none, we will move on to council input. Start on uh, Council Member Bales. You want to start? Sure. Um, Mr. Burkett, did you use the majority of each parcel, you know, to make your decision, or was it um, something different than that? Uh, <laughs> In most cases, it was the majority. I think there were a few where it just didn't make sense to um, introduce where it was like surrounded by one type of zoning district and a little sliver was to change. So in I'd say all but one, we did the majority um, from, an, from an acre standpoint. I think the only one we didn't was because of the Southfield one where the neighborhood requested it. So mm -hmm. it came out to. And did planning board go parcel by parcel? They had, I mean, we showed them these maps, and I gave them the maps in the, uh, in the uh, presentation and in their packet. And do you know the reason why the one property owner did not consent? They just weren't, they said no. I, they never gave a reason, just nope, not interested. Um, it was the, the larger farm that's on North Fairfield Road um, near Indian Ripple, the 235-acre yeah. farm. 
And so, and that one's not included. That is not included. Yeah, we did, we we weren't going to take anybody's property that wasn't on board with it. Yeah. That's all the questions I have. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Randy, Sandra, thank you for for your good work. Um, can you clarify what's happening on page forty-eight of the packet? Because uh, it looks like a lot of it's been cleaned up. I think forty-five and forty-eight overlap on Pheasant Run. And I don't think it's a. I think it's a parcel between the two parcels that have been changed. But it it too is, the changes have been made. Uh, let's see here. I think it, it, it. We only did parcel by parcel, and and. Because the changes have been made either side, but not in the parcel in the middle. That was one. Just they wouldn't contact. Great. Okay, that's what I figured. Thank you. It, uh, here is that what you're talking about? No. 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 Yes. Yes, the one in the middle is uh -huh. the one, one of the ones we couldn't get in contact with. Okay. And I didn't want to nope. force any zoning on it. So <laughs> just, yep. Okay. Councilmember Adams? Uh, I really have no comment. Councilmember Schwartz? No comment. Just thank you for your work. Councilmember Kerr? No comment, Your Honor. No comment here. It makes sense to clean this up. Mm -hmm. so thank you. Yeah. Any further discussion? Do I have a motion to move to the second reading? Mayor, motion. I motion to move Ordinance 23-1 to a second reading. Second. I have a motion and a second to move Ordinance 23-1 onto the second reading. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next is PUD 22-4. PUD 22-4, an application filed by DHC Partners, LLC, 7953, Washington Woods Drive, Dayton, Ohio, 45459. The application requests approval to rezone 8.429 acres from R1A, One Family Residential District, and A1 Agriculture District to RPUD, residential planned unit development to allow for construction of a retirement community. The properties are located at 2705 Lillian Lane, further described as Book 4, Page 4, Parcels 6 and 14 on the Greene County Tax Atlas. Thank you. Ordinance 23-2, an ordinance rezoning 8.429 acres from R-1A, one, one Family Residential, and A-1 Agriculture further described as Book 4, Page 4, Parcel 6, and Parcel 14 on the property tax maps of Greene County, Ohio to RPUD 22-4, Residential Planned Unit Development. Now, thank you. All right, is there an applicant present this evening? Can you please come forward and give us a name and address, and the floor is all yours. Okay. Good evening, Mayor, and good evening, Council, and all the people present here. Uh, I am representing DSC Partners. My name is Raj Kajurwal, uh, 7953 Washington Woods Drive, Dayton, Ohio, 45459. And this, uh, these two parcels are right close to uh, the temple that uh, serves our community, and we are planning to set up a retirement community there. Uh, the two parcels are currently zoned at A1 and R1A, and the zoning application that we have put together is for RPUD. That gives us the ability to, come to use these two parcels with a six density and produce a plan, a site-specific plan, after the rezoning is passed by the council, and then come back to the uh, planning commission for, for approval. So our timeline, uh, we'd like to, once the zoning is approved, we'd like to get the plans in place and start work on it yet this year as per uh, engineering support and architectural support that is available and contractors that may be available. Then select a developer which works in the local area and get it to completion, hopefully by end of 24, if not earlier. Very good. So I'm ready for any questions, concerns? All right. Well, we're going to hear from staff, and then there'll be we'll get to the questions. So thank, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, thank you. Uh, this is an application. It's PUD 22-4. It's a rezoning. Uh, so it would be the first phase of a PUD. And 
Again, the applicant's requesting a rezone about eight and a half acres from partially A1, partially R1A to a new RPUD. Uh, as the applicant stated, it's in northern Beaver Creek, just north of the Hindu temple that's on Lillian Lane right now. Uh, you can see here's an aerial photo uh, of the two parcels. The northern parcel is a little less than five acres, and the southern parcel is a little bit more than three and a half acres. Um, the northern parcel has a house, a uh, driveway, um, and the southern parcel is pretty much completely vacant. There is some landscaping along the southern perimeter of that parcel and along the northern perimeter of the northern parcel um, in terms of shade trees and evergreen trees. Again, the, uh, the northern parcel, parcel is zoned A1 agricultural, and the southern parcel is R1A single-family residential. To the south is CPUD 08-1, <clears throat> excuse me, and that's the Hindu temple. To the west is CPUD 94-4, which is a major um, commercial retail uh, center, uh, regional commercial retail center. Uh, to the east is multifamily um, RPUD 99-9 and 96-1. It's uh, medium density residential to the east. Um, the land use plan has classified this as medium density residential, uh, meaning that um, up to six dwelling units an acre is what medium density is defined in the land use plan. Uh, that is the same classification that's to the north, to the east, and to the south. And to the west is obviously the uh, regional commercial and office uh, designation. Um, what they're proposing uh, this evening is to read it on the property, um, have a modified list of R3, R4 zoning, which allows um, uh, retirement centers and nursing homes um, and, and some multifamily. When I brought this forward to Planning Commission, I included in the proposed uses single family, two family, row houses, or um, townhomes. Um, and there was much discussion at Planning Commission about uh, the concern with traffic generated by um, single family homes and, and two family homes. So um, they, took, they made a motion to remove two families, one family, two family, and, and all the other per, uh, permitted uses and left it with just the conditional uses that you see. Um, well, it's not on that list, but it's the conditional uses you see in your staff report, meaning uh, the conditional uses of R2, nursing homes, places of religious assembly, uh, retirement communities. Um, and one thing that we didn't think about that wasn't realized until after the meeting and after the vote was that, that action removed all uses by right. So there's no permitted uses within the PUD. It's only conditional uses in the PUD. Um, and and so I'm proposing to reinstate the two-family residential, um, the um, multifamily dwellings, boarding houses, public uh, libraries, community centers, and townhomes, which is what you would find that they are permitted uses in the R2 and R3. Um, just looking at the traffic generated by, um, I, I know that their concern was traffic, just looking at the traffic numbers, um, and with the acres they have, they could put 50 units on there at six dwelling units an acre. So 50 units of single family would generate 479 trips a day. Um, 50 units of uh, apartment units, didn't, not necessarily the number in each building, but apartments, 333 trips per day. And then senior living units would be 186 units per day, or trips per day. So that's less than half the unit uh, trips per day. Um, so. What we're proposing is to add back in the two-family and multi-family boarding houses in and, and the, the community. And in the proposed ordinance for your consideration, I highlighted those uses in blue just so you have a differenti differentiation between what is um, permitted and um, what we're, we're proposing to add to the permitted uses. Uh, I reached out to I, I let the uh, Planning Commission know that I was going to propose the inclusion of these new uses um, just based on telling them that, uh, you know, after reflection that, that we removed all the uh, permitted uses and they only have uses that are conditional, it's, it can be a slippery slope of yeah, um, whether or not being regulatory taking because you're not guaranteed conditional uses. There's no guarantee. So I don't want to create a PUD where there's no guaranteed uses in it. Um, so th I, uh, I only heard back from one planning commissioner and they didn't have a problem with it and the others uh, had a planning commission between now and then and they never had brought it up. So 
the chair is the one I talked to, and he said that that makes sense what I'm proposing, but okay. didn't want to take it through the whole public hearing again at Planning Commission. But uh, again, those proposed additional uses are in blue in your, uh, your proposed ordinance, and I'll be happy to answer any questions following the public hearing. Thank you. Thank you. All right, this also is a public hearing. Is there anyone present this evening that would like to address council on this application? Please come forward and give us a name and address. We ask that you limit your comments to about three minutes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the City Council. My name is Mr. Ed Stanick. I'm a uh, <clears throat> uh, resident of the complex uh, immediately uh, east of the proposed development. You need an uh, address, please. Uh, 3060 Willowbrook Way, Thank Beaver you. Creek, 45431. Um, I had... Uh, been uh, a candidate several times for the city, uh, the uh, condominium complex um, board of directors. Um, and so I feel like I represented uh, many people from that community. There's approximately 300 plus residential units there. Uh, you may have know uh, one, or <laughs> one or two of the people on the board. Um, anyway, uh, we haven't had a general discussion of what the general community has, uh, how they feel. But I've spoken to a few people on the uh, uh, board or in former board, as well as some of the residents along Lillian Lane who may be concerned about the development. Now, um, I attended the zoning uh, commission meeting when that was proposed, and I had a chance to meet with Dr. Agrawal and his, his uh, staff people to, uh, and what their goal was in trying to uh, develop this property. Um, I feel um, there are a couple of people that were objection, had some object objections. My main concern, and I think the concern of the uh, residents in that general area, uh, especially some of the homeowners on Hillsdale Lane, was the traffic along Lillian Lane. Um, otherwise, the project is, I think, uh, they're good. The temple has been a good neighbor. Uh, I know Dr. Agrawal, and I know people that are uh, friends, uh, uh, friends of mine that are friends of his. <laughs> so um, we would like to be good neighbors and work together to make this a good project for the community and for the general neighborhood. So at this point, I don't object to or won't object to any of the changes in zoning as long as it, it fits the city's requirements. And um, hopefully we'll be able to uh, work through this to the best benefit of everyone, again, with the concern for traffic and the roadway. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? All right, seeing none, I'm going to close the public hearing, and we will go just reverse. I'll ask Council Member Curran if he'd like to any comments. I don't have any comments, Your Honor. I think it's going to be a good, good facility and uh, work together. All right. Council Member Schwartz. I also do not have any questions or comments at this time. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Councilmember Adams. I don't have any comments on this, but I, I know from when it comes to a site survey, I'll have several questions. Sure. So, uh, so at different. this point, I don't have anything. Councilmember Dewar. Thank you, Mayor. To float an idea uh, to put back 2G alone and to strike the rest of them, uh, Randy, just I'd like to get your wisdom on that because for the residents, there is a real concern of traffic. The applicant wants to put in place a nursing home, so 2G makes sense. And so to assuage any concern about changes or how this would um, affect the community, given that the applicant wants a nursing home, 2G would fit it. Um, is that the one we could put back alone? or? I mean, you could put those back alone. I mean, I think that... To give options, I mean, if they decide they want to do duplexes for as a retirement community, but then not necessarily limit it to only mm -hmm. 55 and up, mm -hmm. I just think that the more flexibility we can have, um, knowing that there's also a condition that they can't be more than six dwelling units an acre. So, I mean, regardless if, uh, if they do it one building or duplexes or 
uh, or quads or six in a, in a building, they can't go more than the 50 uh, units at all. I think that the biggest, I mean, uh, the where it stands out from a traffic standpoint is single families sure. above. Uh -huh. I mean, it's it's on a level of its own. That's why we're suggesting not putting that back in. But you know, city council obviously can pick and choose whatever they want on this. But this this is what we we recommend just. It, just so that there are options um, and not have to come back through the legislative process if something changes. And there's a bigger picture at play in terms of development, so yeah. I understand that. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Councilmember Bales. I want to thank you for running it by the Planning Commission after you had the revelation. Um, and you did say that you had a, you've had a meeting since then and it wasn't even mentioned, is that correct? Yeah, I was expecting if somebody was mad for them to say something, I mean, offline, obviously, but but they didn't say anything except the chairman called me about 20 minutes after I sent the email out and it was, like, oh, and it was in agreement. And, oh. Okay, very good. Mm -hmm. The traffic on uh, Lillian Lane and Hillsdale, it, I can imagine the concern. I share the concern. I think it's largely a, a big cut through street to avoid the mall traffic and and everything else so I understand that um, I'm not certain that a retirement community is going to adversely affect that too much though so certainly require have less than a half number okay. of trips than a single-family neighborhood would yeah do we this have is also in the impact fee eligible district too okay. so when we get to the when we get to the site plan stage there are impact fees that have to be required so that impact fee could be used on any impact fee eligible roadway improvement mm -hmm. when they when we find that they're needed thinking about councilman Dewar's question about 2g the retirement communities do we have a definition of what that we do means the retirement community is as we define it in a zoning code is any community that yeah, falls under Basically, it's any community that has the age restriction of 55 and up, so where, where, it's, where it's governed by that section of the ORC that they can limit. So, but does it does it does it specifically spell out a type of building? I mean, could I call duplexes and name it a retirement community, sure. or certainly, you know, I mean, so yeah, the the uh, the two buildings that are going on. Park Overlook, one that's already there, and then the other one that's under construction now, those are retirement communities. But there's nothing that would say that, I mean, even a single family neighborhood, if that would be a real challenge when you're selling individual buildings like that um, to allow only 55 and up. But um, anything, I mean, it, it doesn't specify that it has to be at least this many units per building or anything like that. Okay, I have no questions. And I think if that was made clear in the verbiage that it still does not preclude doubles if, as long as it is a 55 or older community. That's if we want to classify it as a retirement, but you can put two dwelling units as a retirement community in the conditions, but right now it's just, it could be non-retirement community duplex duplexes as it stands now. Well, that's what we're trying to say. Maybe we want to loop around that and just add that verbiage that two families within a retirement community, okay, or something like that. Is that, is that where you were trying to head to maybe get, you know, that restriction that mm. two families are fine as long as it is a, quote, retirement community versus a college town, so to speak. Uh, and not that I am have anything negative against college. <laughs> we did exclude dormitories from the proposed uses. <laughs> it's actually an allowed use in an R2 or R3 and R4. And no, I didn't that, think that, that may that be, but there, all those on Zinc Road, those apartments and condos, those are not dormitories. Those are, those are college kids living in private properties. Mm -hmm. So if I could reiterate then or ask the question, then maybe 2G is the only one we would want to entertain because all those other things would fall underneath it as long as it was a if, if that's the route you guys are going but well i mean i maybe that's a question for the applicant i think it's also a question for the legal because what's happening is we don't want to 
even though I think I want to do what you're talking about, we don't want to restrict things too much because we're taking property rights away from the property owner. To protect the neighborhood is another story. If we leave it the way it's being proposed, the property could be sold, mm -hmm. and some new owner could come in and put whatever he wanted in there. Right. Certainly not retirement. So that's the any any thoughts on that? So you could restrict it down to just the one permitted use under G from a legal standpoint. From a practical standpoint, it's going to make difficulties in the future if this property is ever sold or used for any other purpose. But that would require a zoning change. That's, Correct. That's yes. That's the process. Yes. <laughs> right. You could come in for a zoning change if something changed. All right. Uh, Any further discussion on on, uh, on the permitted uses? Staff? No? Are you comfortable if we were to just add the verbiage to, and not, not that it changes anything, but it just simply outlines and spells out that, yes, doubles are allowed in a, in a uh, retirement community, I mean, as low as the doubles. Or is well, I mean, in reality, if you left just G, I mean, that would include doubles. They're, they're, they would still fall underneath the retirement community. But if okay, so we don't need to spell it out any. No, the reason I put them back, I was just trying to expand. I mean, the reason I kept du duplexes in is so that if in the future the retirement community doesn't happen and somebody wants to build similar to what they have across the street, they could do that without going through the legislative process. But Obviously, I mean, if council wants to limit it just retirement communities on this, then G is all you really need. And the process, if somebody, if they did sell and somebody came back in and said they wanted to put uh, condos like across the street over there, they would just have to come back through here with for a zoning change to add that to the PUD, correct? They would amend, they would need to amend the PUD. Right, they'd go through the same process. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Could I get the opinion of, of the owner, the applicant? Well, what I'd like to, or we would like to say is uh, our initial focus is a retirement community. But any plan that any, any builder or any developer would like to do, would like to have flexibility so that the financial prerogatives are also maintained. So if it does not hurt the uh, traffic uh, side of things on linear lane, then the flexibility would be something that would be nice for us to have, for a developer to come in and develop the property. Our focus is a retirement community for now. Mm. Uh, that is our focus because it fits very well with our geography there. And the size of the property is less than 10 acres, is eight and a half. It's not going to increase the number of people that are densely, power, densely there. Uh, we are maintaining 50 unit kind of 50 unit whatever the number comes out to be from a six density so the traffic should be it is a concern but based on the number of people that we are going to be living there it sh it should be not that difficult for the people living across the street and uh, other places so what I would request the committee and the council to look at is Give us flexibility if possible. Our focus is retirement community, and it avoids additional steps and becomes make, makes the project more financially viable. All right, thank you, Randy. Would you give me the numbers again on the single family versus doubles, two family? What I was provided by the engineer was single family versus multi-family. Multi-family. All right. Get that for you. Uh, 50 single ham 50 single family homes is 479 trips per day. Okay. 50 apartment units, multifamily apartment units is 333 trips per day. And 50 senior living units is 186 trips per day. Okay. I don't know for sure, but I got a fairly good feeling that the uh property to the east is occupied by a large number of senior citizens. 
Uh, so my guess is that this, even if it was not a, quote, senior community, it would still attract those people, myself included. And uh, so I doubt that even leaving it the way you have it, that the traffic would be any more from this development than it is already from the other, if you just go acreage by, you know, same number of acres, same number of units. Now, yeah, is it going to increase some vehicles? Anything's going to increase vehicles on Lillian Lane. That's There's no way around that. But, uh, all right, I understand staff's position, and I'm willing to go with it myself. Uh, anything else? All right, do I have a motion to move this to the second reading? Your Honor, I'd move that Ordinance 23-2 to a second reading. Second. I have a motion and a second to move Ordinance 23-2 on to the second reading. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. And I will just make this simple announcement. This is, this is the first reading, so there will be another reading. And at that time, should things change, we can change as well. But it, uh, uh, I'm looking forward to that property being uh, used for a, a good purpose in our community. So thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Next is PUD Z22-2. Z22-2, an application filed by Matthew Thomas, 3550 Woodman Drive, Kettering, Ohio, 45429. The application requests the rezoning of 10.177 acres from R-1A, one family residential district, to A-1 agricultural district. The property is located at the southwest corner of I-675 and East Patterson Road, further described as Book oh, yeah. 2, Page 6, Parcel 74 on the Greene County Property Tax Atlas. Ordinance 23-3, an ordinance to rezone 10.177 acres from R-1-A, one family residential, to A-1 agricultural, further described as Book 2, page 8, parcel 74 on the property tax maps of the Greene County, tax, Greene County, Ohio, excuse me. All right. Thank you. All right. Is the applicant present? Come on up. Give us a name and address, and now you have the floor. My name is Matthew Thomas. My address is 3550 Woodman Drive, Kettering, Ohio, 45429. So we brought the we bought the property, me and my wife, off of East Patterson Road, with our main goal of building a single family residence on it. Um, we're wanting to get it rezoned back to agricultural, so we'll be able to keep some animals on the property. Um, when our kids get older, we want them to have the ability to raise some animals and things like that. We're not doing anything big. We want to have some chickens and maybe some goats and a cow or something like that. Um, and we're wanting to utilize the front three acres or so that's already used as our agricultural right now to put animals on. We're not going to clear any of the woods in the back or anything. We want to leave those and just make some paths through there so we can walk through them and things. But it's not going to be cleared out for a bunch of animals and things like that. So mostly just to have a little bit of country in the middle of the city. There you go. So. <clears throat> All right. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor Stone, members of council. Before you an application requesting approval to rezone approximately 10 acres uh, at 4185 East Patterson Road from R1A One Family Residential to A1 Agricultural. Property is located just west of the 675 East Patterson Road underpass. Uh, as you can see, it is uh, mostly wooded with a portion of it uh, being used agriculturally. The property was uh, recently purchased by the applicant and, and had previously been owned by uh, the Miami Valley Research Park and, and had been used agriculturally for several years. Land use plan designates this area, oh, this is a zoning map, sorry. The, the zoning map, as I stated, uh, the, the property is zoned R1A. The adjacent properties uh, are zoned A1 to the north. Uh, that property is a uh, church. Then to the south, you have uh, Bergamo, Mount St. John's. That property is zoned A1. And then to the west, uh, you have um, the R1A neighborhood. To the east, just across the highway, 
is the Miami Valley, uh, now the city of Beaver Creek property, also used to be Miami Valley Research Park property, and at one point, these two, the, the park property and this property being rezoned were all one single property. When the uh, 675 was put in, it divided, the, divided that property up into two separate properties. Uh, the land use plan does designate this area uh, within VPA 62, the yellow area, as low density residential. As the applicant stated, he, he just wants to uh, build one house on the property, which would maintain that low density residential designation. Uh, as it sits now being zoned R1A, uh, because it is 10 acres, uh, they could do approximately uh, 20 homes, 20 single family homes uh, on that R1A property. Um, with uh, the applicant's intent to just have a hobby farm, uh, staff does not have any concerns with that request. We do want to make note that any new structures, any accessory structures that would be built if they decide to build a barn would have to be at least 50 feet from that residential uh, property line just because this is this would now be an agricultural property. So we did we did change that in the code in, in, in uh, 2008 that any agricultural property abutting residential property does have to maintain a 50 foot buffer for okay. any outbuildings. So there, there is still that buffer that would be required. Uh, but Planning Commission uh, did, uh, is recommending approval and staff also is recommending approval uh, as outlined in the attached ordinance. And if you have any questions, I can uh, answer those following the public hearing. Thank you. All right, this also is a public hearing. Is there anyone here tonight that would like to address council on this application? If there is, please come forward. Give us a name and address and limit your comments to about three minutes, please. My name is Jim Martin. Um, I live at 1765 Pershing Boulevard in Dayton, and I'm the pastor of Grace Christian Center directly across the street from this property. I really don't have any objections to uh, the proposed use, but I do have a question, yeah. and the question would be this. As uh, it's my understanding that uh, the intention is in part to build a house on this property. So then what are the plans at this time concerning water and sewer for the proposed house. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? All right, seeing none, we will close the public hearing. And uh, Councilmember Adams, you got any comments? No, I think uh, I went out and looked at that property today, and it was, uh, it's a, it would be good for what you want to use it for, I think. Uh, yeah. I would want to uh, probably talk to you a little bit about what kind of animals you want to have there as we go further along, but uh, <coughs> I think overall, I, I think it would be a good place, a good spot. Council Member Dewar. Yeah, I like the idea as well, especially teaching the next generation. Uh, so kudos to you for that and for your ideas. I do have two questions for you, uh, if I may, and then I, I do want to follow up on something that was said at the Planning Commission. Uh, as well um, the location of the house would be towards the front of the property it would be uh, towards the back of the property to okay. Ab okay. about where the woods line is okay um, and would uh, do you have a plan for a fence fenced in area for animals or? yeah so we don't have any plans drawn up yet we're in the process of getting sure. them drawn up but our plan is to put the um, house towards the back and have a driveway down the middle, sure. have two fenced-in pastures on either side of the driveway, and, uh, yeah, just have a nice fence around them. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because I see on the property line there is a gap in the tree line. Um, so just, I think, out of good neighborliness to connect it but behind it um, or to chat with the homeowner and see their perspective at this time as well just to, just to work things out as neighbors so okay thanks mm -hmm. <clears throat> council member bail uh along those same lines i mean i think it's pretty cool and usually don't have any issues with downgrading zoning um but can we talk a little bit about the uh permitted uses in a1 right uh, right next to the residential neighborhood is the only thing that kind of concerns me, and if, if you've heard from any of those neighbors. 
So there are a few permitted uh, principal uses in A1. So you have agricultural activities, obviously, um, home occupations, uh, one family dwellings, sale of farm products grown or raised on the premises, and uh, nursery with no retail structure. So those are the, the permitted principal uses. Um, and then the conditional uses, which would have to go back through planning commission, airport landing strips, cemeteries, right. uh, places Cemetery. for religious assembly, nursery schools, wireless telecommunication, wireless telecommunication facilities, landscape contractors, and a nursery with a retail structure. How about um, quantity of livestock in a 10-acre parcel? We, yeah, we, in our code, we don't have any, we don't outline uh, in an agricultural district what any types of quantities or what you can and can't have. I mean, I totally think the use that the applicant is presenting is great. I'm just thinking down the line a little bit. Um, did planning board did not have any discussion on that topic? They did not. Okay. Thank you. Council Member Schwartz. I just wanted to get clarification on Pastor Martin's question as to. Right. So they, they would be allowed to, uh, because of the size of the property, they would be al allowed to have a septic tank. They would be able to um, have a well. They also would have the option to tie into to, uh, water and sewer. But those would obviously be questions for the applicant would want to speak to sanitary engineering and figure out what the best thing is for them. But they could do all of those, yes. Okay. Hmm. Thank you. Okay. And most of that plat to the west does not have city water Correct. already. Correct. Okay. All right. Council Member Kern? Uh, that was my same question, having to do with the water and the sewer. These are legitimate issues, and uh, I'm glad to hear some direction here that can be followed, Your Honor. Okay. And, you know, the uh, this is straight zoning, correct? Correct. So there's no conditions that can be put on this. This is, uh, this is not something that we're saying like the previous two where we can say let's do this and that. And uh, This is straight zoning, so whatever's in the code is what he's allowed to do. And, uh, you know, the number one effort out there is to be a good neighbor, and that's what it takes in the whole community. So uh, any other comments? Do I have a motion? Motion to move Ordinance 23-3 to a second reading. Second. Second. I have a motion and a second to move Ordinance 23-3 on to the second reading. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. All right. Ordinances, resolutions, and PUDs. First is Ordinance 22-29. Ordinance 22-29, an ordinance amending commercial planned unit development 99-11, further described as Book 1, Page 9, Parcels 113 and 115 on the property tax maps of Greene County, Ohio, to revise ingress and egress access limitations. Thank you. Staff, have any further input? Council, have any uh, comment on the second reading? I'm not sure who was the uh, sponsor for the council members. Move to approve ordinance 22-29. Second. second. I have a motion and a second to approve ordinance 22-29. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. All right. Next is resolution 23-1. Resolution 23-1, a resolution authorizing the city manager or his designee, the financial administrative services director, to request advance draws upon the amounts collected by the Greene County Auditor for the City of Beaver Creek 2022 real estate and personal property taxes collected during calendar year 2023. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Mayor and members of uh, City Council. This is our uh, annual request to the County Auditor to uh, provide us uh, advances in our property tax collection. They usually uh, send the uh, property tax over in March and August by sending in this resolution and authorizes him to release that early. 
So last year we uh, received eight advances, totaling almost $16 million. So in the old days when interest didn't mean a whole lot, uh, it didn't really matter that much. But uh, now that uh, Star Ohio is almost at four and a half, uh, those extra months and days of uh, getting our money early uh, might mean something eventually to our interest uh, revenue. Sure. Mm -hmm. So th this action just asks him to uh, provide us that service. All right, thank you. Any questions? Motion to approve resolution 23-1. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve resolution 23-1. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next is uh, Resolution 23-2, and this is the first of three resolutions that are all on the same subject, but uh, we'll get into those. We're going to read the resolution first here. Resolution number 23-2, a resolution by Beaver Creek City Council determining it necessary to pro proceed with submitting the question of levying an additional tax in excess of the 10 mil limitation to the electors of the city. Pursuant to Ohio Revised Code Section 5705-.19 and Subsection 5705.19J, as amended for the purpose of providing and maintaining motor vehicles, communications, other equipment, buildings, and sites for such buildings used directly in the operation of the police department for the payment of salaries of permanent or part-time police communications or administrative personnel to operate the same, including the payment of any employer contributions required for such personnel pursuant to section 145.48 or, or 742.33 of the Ohio Revised Code or for other related costs which levy shall be one and two tenths, 1.2 mills, and which levy shall run for a continuing period of time pursuant to Ohio Revised Code section 5705.19 and requesting the county auditor to certify matters in connection therewith. Thank you. You know you have to do that two more times. Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> oh, man. All right. So I'm going to, uh, this is the first of three resolutions on the agenda that all deal with the same subject. And so we will get the overview from staff and then we will go through each resolution. All right, Council, uh, Mayor and City Council, uh, tonight, as you just heard, uh, we've uh, talked about this in the work session just prior to this, uh, about the police funding. This is what it really uh, has, to, has to deal with. Um, the, um, so there's really uh, on the uh, agenda tonight, you have three options, really, but the blank one is last, and that just means it's a fill-in-the-blank style. So. Uh, council would have the option to uh, do anything that they would uh, see fit. Uh, I will say this uh, to, for those uh, watching or listening, this is just the first step uh, of certifying the levy amount. So this is a, before this is, does not put it on the ballot. This just simply uh, sends, a, sends this resolution to the county auditor to ask him to certify what does 1.2 mils <coughs> equal, what does 1.8 mils equal, or fill in the blank what does blank equal uh, that's all that does and then at a certain time we'll have a calendar of the, uh, at the end of this presentation so the police budget and staffing update the 2023 police budget uh, represents a status quo uh, for staffing of 2023 but we'll possibly need to begin steps of reductions in 2024 or so uh, we had a little shift of because of uh, of a changing of vacancies extreme vacancies i would put that uh, caused uh, additional uh, expenses not to be spent basically uh, and with cares and covid uh, money that came in as well that uh, helped the fund balance to a certain de degree so we're talking about uh, making this funding funding continue to stretch as we have but if uh, ex additional funding is not secured in 2023 we do have to look at beginning certain actions in 2024 uh, which is just around the corner because anything we put on the levy right now if it's passed in may would not be collected until 2024. i know it's hard to start talking about future years already but uh, it sneaks up on you real quick uh, 2023 proposed deficit budget is about 1.4 million that's what we adopted 
It's on page 34 of the budget book. Uh, the expenditures uh, exceeded the levy revenue growth, causing the deficit to continue to grow without reductions, uh, without reducing. Uh, that's something that we have to always explain on as we operate off of property tax levies um, that I'll explain here in a second. About 75% of the police department budget is personnel costs. So when you come down to uh, other additional costs, hard costs, gasoline costs, fixing the building, fixing, buying, purchasing capital equipment, um, that only represents about 25% of it. Um, you know, paying your electric bill and, and, and things of that nature. Uh, the last additional funding was in tw uh, 2014, so that's been nine years without additional funding. The average historical growth of the property tax levies is under 2% per year. Uh, it fixed levies, that's why I wanted to really stress here, a lot of people, if they got a you know house a reappraisal done by the county auditor on their house and say it increased it by 10%, they think their property tax and the city gets additional 10%. Uh, that is not true. These are fixed levies. So. I uh, told Rotary this week that, uh, or last week, that uh, it's like uh, a cruise ship and you have deck chairs on a cruise ship. We only have 100 deck chairs. So no matter what happens with your property tax uh, increase as far as uh, your house appraisal happens, uh, we still get 100 deck chairs. Uh, 25 may be moved over to the other side of the ship versus the 50 and you know rearrange the deck chairs. But in the end, the city does not receive any additional funding because of reappraisals for levies. 90% of the property tax we receive is directly from fixed levies, which do not change according to property reappraisals. Only the inside millage of the general fund goes up and down according to property appraisals, which is a less than 7% of our total, total city-wide budget. So very small portion. Uh, so just wanted to explain that. Uh, we've said that we've operated, uh, utilized $2 million in uh, non-levy funding. That's what's helped stretch this uh, CARES and ARPA funding to help stretch these levy dollars over the past few years. The 2023 budget savings due to the extreme staffing shortages and uh, you know these types of revenues you know have extended the levy. Uh, we're waiting on most building issues and re repairs in 2023. There's issues that we can't address unless we have major reconstruction uh, or um, a new building, um, which uh, if you do notice, we did not put the new building on as an option. That, pat that uh, did fail last time with that. Uh, we didn't put that on as option, but there is a fill in the blank. So if city council, that still gives you an option if that's the uh, method or way you want to move ahead. Um, but we will continue to do the re basic repairs that we we have to do out of safety concerns. Um, it was mentioned during that as well, House Bill 512, one of the factors is the additional in uh, pension funding that uh, the House Bill 512 is taking up that could cause and change the percentage that the uh, municipalities would have to pay on pension funding. Uh, which could be up to a million dollars a year in additional funding that the city would be liable for. In this chart, uh, this is a chart that we were just shown again. You see the uh, the top of the part. We start with 2022, and the 2023 budget uh, deficits 1.4 million, and as you see it grow, 1.8, uh, which then at that point in time in 2024, you end the year just below the fund balance, and I. I would highly recommend for any city council that we do not drain fund balances. Uh, if you went on into 2025, you would literally drain the fund balance. What happens there is if you drain the fund balance, you're you know, putting you know, things in jeopardy as far as uh, funding, but you also uh, then when you go back to ask for a levy, you're having asked for a larger amount to compensate for the lack of fund balance. Uh, so it gets you in the end one way or the other as far as uh, the fund balance. Um, so a, as this chart goes, shows you the top line just as the growth of the expected revenue versus the uh, expect, expected expenses. And as I said, those two get further and further apart as, you know, property tax is 2% or less growth and uh, even the basic cost of inflation uh, 
not even mentioning the type of inflation we're going under now. Uh, this is a, uh, projected as a basic uh, type of inf inflation. And as you see in 2024, the bottom part of the graph is where the two lines intersect is where the uh, cash balance drops below the 20% recommended fund balance. And so future actions without additional funding. Uh, the current authorized uh, staffing is 50 sworn officers. That's been since 2018. Uh, in 96, it was 46 sworn officers, uh, and again, about 75% of the total 2023 budget is in personnel costs. So currently, we have 47 officers and one cadet. Uh, we're still been, you know, as Chief told you just before, during the work sessions, we've been in a constant state of hiring as we've had uh, retirements and, and uh, people leaving for other jobs. Um, that have decided to move on. Uh, the city manager, I have uh, continued to authorize the chief to continue to try to fill the vacancies. Um, expecting additional retirements and vacancies in 2023, we've already been notified of those. And uh, funding uncertainty does, uh, does impact the ability to attract and retain officers. That's one thing, I think the first thing that they will look at is if somebody is wanting to either change their career from one city or another city to move to here, one thing they're going to look at is uh, not only accreditation and everything that we strive for, but they'll look at the uh, stability of the financial um, for their future, for their best interest. Um, when you're looking at the pre police, uh, our projected police budget deficit, as we've uh, stated here, uh, as it grows each year, and you think about the 75% of the budget is personnel cost, then you look at what an officer or a sergeant uh, makes in the range with all benefits, all everything, you begin to see, okay, if I have a 1.8 million, 2.15 million budget deficit, yet in 75% of my budget is personnel costs, you know, I can't cut gasoline, I can't cut electric bills, you know, we can do what we can as far as efficiencies, but there's, uh, it comes down to the meat of where's the majority of your funding, and that would be personnel costs. Uh, which we could do during uh, hiring freezes and, you know, ho hopefully extend, uh, do it through attrition, but that's if we get to that point. Right now we would be looking at late 24 and definitely for the 2025 budget of having to definitely address those. Um, that's what I considered because of what happened with the CARES money and everything. Our cliff, if you want to call it a cliff, uh, got moved out a year, basically. So now we were at a cliff that we had to do something this year, uh, or I mean, or a, a cliff was happening where it was going to be drastic. Now it's a year before we have to actually take the drastic measures uh, that we'd have to, which I'd rather not be up against the cliff, <laughs> to be honest. So this is, uh, it doesn't change the need, doesn't change what's happening, <coughs> but it does move the cliff. Uh, but. Uh, I'm much more comfortable on this side of the cliff than the other. Um, and a delay of uh, capital equipment, of course, is something we would always consider to save funding. And you saw this, the timeline tonight. Again, this is just requesting the county auditor to certify the millage. Uh, we have before you the resolutions prepared, 1.2, 1.8, and a blank one. Uh, January 23rd, uh, there would have to be one selected, or I guess none, if uh, that would be the will of uh, council but only one can be placed on the ballot. So there'd be a resolution on the ballot, multiple resolutions if so desired, but only one could be approved. And February 10th is the deadline to file with the Board of Elections for the May 9th election. And of course, May 9th is the election. And Bill, Mr. Katera, and myself are here for any questions. All right, thank you. All right, so this resolu the resolution in front of us tonight, along with the next two, are just simply to ask the county auditor for the revenue from this levy. Any discussion? I think we need to know the revenue for 1.2 mil, so is there a motion? Motion to approve resolution 23-2. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve resolution 23-2. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. All right, next, I know you have to read it, but it's resolution 23-3. Uh, and wake us up when you're finished. 
<laughs> resolution 23-3. A resolution by Beaver Creek City Council determining it necessary to proceed with submitting the question of levying an additional tax in excess of the 10 mil limitation to the electors of the city pursuant to Ohio Revised Code Section 5705.19 and subsection 5705.19J as amended for the purpose of providing and maintaining motor vehicles, communications, other equipment, buildings, and sites for such buildings used directly in the operation of the police department for the payment of salaries of permanent or part-time police communications or administrative personnel to operate the same, including the payment of any employer contributions required for such personnel pursuant to section 145.48 or 742.33 of the Ohio Revised Code, or for other related costs which levy shall be one and eight tenths, 1.8 mills, and which levy shall run for the continuing period of time pursuant to Ohio Revised Code section 5705.19, and requesting the county auditor to certify ma matters in connection therewith. Okay, thank you very much. All right, we've heard uh, the different options, and this one would be for the five additional officers. Uh, any comments? Again, this is something that, that we need to know the dollar amount. So unless you're opposed to it entirely, we need this resolution passed. May, so I, have, yes. oh, may I move to approve resolution 23-3? Second. I have a motion and a second to approve resolution 23-3. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next is resolution 23-4. Resolution 23-4, a resolution by Beaver Creek City Council determining it necessary to proceed with submitting the question of levying an additional tax in excess of the 10 mil limitation to the electors of the city pursuant to Ohio Revised Code Section 5705.19 and subsection 5705.19J as amended for the purpose of providing and maintaining motor vehicles, communications, other equipment, buildings, and sites for such buildings used directly in the operation of the police department for the payment of salaries of permanent or part-time police communications or administrative personnel to operate the same including the payment of any employer contributions required for such personnel pursuant to section 145.48 or 742.33 of the Ohio Revised Code or for other related costs which levy shall be blank mills and which levy shall run for a continuing period of time pursuant to Ohio Revised Code section 5705.19 and requesting the county auditor to certify matters in connection therewith. Thank you. All right, this resolution, if we wanted to plug a number into it, could be for anything, but it could also then be as high as what we had on the ballot last time. Uh, and if there's no interest in doing that, then I, my recommendation is that I get a motion to approve and no second. So. Is there any f discussion? Anybody interested in uh, filling in the blank on this resolution? Mm -mm. Then can somebody make a motion to approve resolution 23-4? So Robert, Robert's rules requires there be a motion. Yep. Right. <laughs> Move to approve resolution 23-4. Is there a second? Seeing none, the motion fails for the lack of a second. Thank you. Next is Resolution 23-5. Resolution 23-5, a resolution by Beaver Creek City Council extending the moratorium on the acceptance of new applications for electronic variable message signs or digital billboards in the city of Beaver Creek for an additional six months and imposing a six-month moratorium on the acceptance of new applications for off-premise signs in the city of Beaver Creek, Ohio. Thank you. And we would ask council to address this one. So this is, the extension is similar to what has been passed in, in the previously. 
So we're just extending that for another six months to review the, the current code. There is one change to this one, including uh, not allowing any off-premises signs. There was a case just last year. Um, it was in the Supreme Court, the city of Austin versus a sign company. You guys don't really need to know the name. Um, wherein a very similar statute was upheld by the Supreme Court um, that just prohibited off-premises signs. Comments? Questions? Do I hear a motion? Move to approve Resolution 23-5. Second. second. I have a motion and a second to approve Resolution 23-5. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? <clears throat> motion carries. Thank you. Next is liquor permit. Chief? Good evening, Mayor and members of council. Good evening. Uh, before you this evening, we have a liquor permit. It's a transfer. Uh, the Ohio Department of Commerce Division of Liquor Control sent notification of a request regarding the transfer of a C1 and C2 liquor permit from Philly Petroleum LLC. Uh, they're doing business as Dayton Xenia Marathon at 3810 uh, Dayton Xenia Road in Beaver Creek. Uh, they're transferring it to Monac 1011 LLC at the same location. Uh, the record checks required by the Ohio Department of Commerce Division of Liquor Control were conducted on the applicants and shareholders for this application request and there are no concerns or issues. And staff is recommending this application re move forward without further comment. Thank motion you. to accept without comment. I have a motion and a second on the floor. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next is council time. And uh, Council Member Schwartz, you want to kick it off? Sure. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm going to keep it short and sweet. I only have two things that I wanted to address. The first is Citizen Police Academy. Um, for those of you who have not had an opportunity to go through the Citizen Police Academy, it is an excellent opportunity to get a firsthand look at what our police department does on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I went through it last year, year before last, and it was such a great experience. So for those who are interested, I would encourage you to explore and apply for the program. Um, the second thing that I wanted to address was I wanted to commend the Beaver Creek Police Department. Um, we had a small incident on our street where my husband caught a porch pirate in the act, and so he called the police department, and there was a very quick response, and so he was very pleased by that. So always working um, around the clock and just thankful for their response time. That's all I have, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Curran. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, first of all, I want to congratulate the uh, manager for his presentation to Rotary. He mentioned it earlier, but I think he did a very uh, decisive approach and uh, presented uh, all the uh, options to uh, to the members of the Rotary. Number two, certainly glad to participate in Wardering Your Park in December. That was really fun to go out and see all the activities that were taking place there and to hear about uh, bathroom options for the barn, which were very interesting. And then, of course, uh, all of us were there for uh, Golden Corral. Uh, that was a uh, fantastic opening, and we're glad to see that restaurant back in action, and uh, it was really exciting to see all the people outside waiting to get in. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. Councilmember Bales. Well, I will echo Councilman Curran's uh, comments. Uh, the Wardinger Park cabins were decorated very nicely, and I want to thank the volunteer organizations who spent their time and and money to do that and that was a really great day and a lot of people had a good time including my daughter and I so that was fun uh, and also welcome back Golden Corral that was a, a nice ribbon cutting and I wish them the best and finally last week I had the opportunity to uh, attend the school chat with the superintendent day hmm. uh, and it was very a very nice um, small group uh, basically, uh, myself, a couple of citizens, and a couple of school board members, and the superintendent, and just got to uh, hear the, about their future plans, uh, and then also listen to a couple of comments and concerns for some from some parents. So, it was um, it was just a nice uh, way to listen to the school board and superintendent respond to some of those issues and talk about the future. So it was, it was cool. Finally, just happy New Year to everybody. There you go. Councilmember Dewar. Thank you, Mayor. Um, 
Likewise, I'd like to congratulate uh, Golden Corral on their reopening. Really a, a wonderful event uh, and ribbon cutting. And I think about some uh, of the businesses in northern Beaver Creek that had the double whammy of being hit by the tornado and then COVID. And so this is a, a business that was really hit, hit hard because of COVID, just given their model. And so fantastic to see uh, the redesign to the building, uh, all the remodeling, and uh, congratulations on reopening. Really wonderful to have them back. A couple of shout outs. Um, first is to Beaverview Bowl. My, my son took part in an after school program uh, this past semester. I uh, got to ride the big red bus and then uh, go bowling, and they <laughs> uh, they had a wonderful time with his teammates. So I I, I, I just thought it was the uh, really great event. So shout out to Beaverview Bowl, and then congratulations to the Beaver Creek High School ice hockey team uh, who won the fifth their fifth straight Dayton Mayors tournament. Uh, really remarkable. It's one thing to win a tournament once and then to repeat and then to do it five times. Uh, so congratulations to them. Very good. Councilmember Adams. Thank you, sir. Uh, I hope everyone had a great holiday, uh, got a chance to re-energize and uh, get ready for this new year. I'd like to recognize today this National Law Enforcement Day. Uh, we in Beaver Creek are fortunate to have a great group of men and women who put the uniform and badge on every day to keep us safe, and we want to thank them for everything they do. And as uh, Councilman Schwartz said, uh, Beaver Creek Police, Citizens Police Academy is coming up. It's a great way to learn, get a little insight into the day in the life of a police officer, uh, find out what they all have to do. Uh, I was able to participate in the gift wrapping and distribution of gifts and food boxes to uh, several citizens in Beaver Creek who uh, were in need. I want to thank the Rotary Club of Beaver Creek for sponsoring that activity. I had a fun time with uh, participating in the Meet the Grinch with the Beaver Creek Police at the, the Fairfield Commons Mall. I, don't remember the total numbers, but there was between 1,500 and 2,000 kids that came through there to see the Grinch. It was a, a really impressive turnout. And I want to thank the Fairfield Commons Mall and Beaver Creek Police Department for sponsoring that. I was able to represent the city at the Wright Brothers' first flight memorial celebration uh, out at the Wright Memorial. This commemorates the Wright Brothers' first flight on December 17, 1903. Uh, I, too, attended the Wardinger Park. Welcome to uh, Wardinger Park uh, Christmas deal. And uh, I want to thank the Parks Department for putting that on. They do a great job every year. And also to the uh, Kiwanis Club, Historical Society, the Optimist Club for all the work that they did out there. And for Pete figuring out how to plug in all the lights. <laughs> <laughs> I was also happy to support the Bears for Children's at Build-A-Bear at the Fairfield Commons Mall with... Uh, Calista Hess, she's done this for several years. I don't know what the total number of bears she was able to produce, but I know her goal was 700, and she gives all those to the uh, Children's Medical Center for the kids that come through the emergency room and those that have to stay in the hospital through the holidays, so that's a, that's a great activity. I, too, attended the ribbon cutting at Golden Corral. I missed out on the food because I had to leave, but that's okay. Several other people were able to partake of that. And now I get to uh, recognize some employees and their anniversaries uh, for Beaver Creek. Uh, Andy Amburn in golf, 18 years. Joe Moore, golf, 18 years. Joel Diaz, police, 11 years. Joel Schuler, police, 6 years. Jerry Russell, public service, 11 years. Mike Winterbotham, Public service, 11 years. Trevor Gray, public service, two years. Zach White, Parks, 13 years. Chief Fiorita, 31 years. Sean Sumner, police, 31 years. Tyler Barlage, senior center, three years. Karen Mahaffey, police, 12 years. Lori McIntosh, police, seven years. Emilio Belager, I hope I pronounced that right, public service, 14 years. Uh, Clayton Campbell, public service, 14 years. Kevin Vance, public service, 14 years. Jake Klein Kleinhans, golf, six years. Don Cole, police, 28 years. Greg Weisert, police, 15 years. 
Sarah DeBoard Police, nine years, and Terrence Sullivan Golf, 11 years. We have a lot of really good employees here with the city of Beaver Creek, and they do stay around a long, a long time, and it's really great to see that. It's, uh, we really commend their directors and supervisors for keeping them around. So that's all I have, sir. All right. All right. First meeting of 2023. It's going to be a good year, I do believe. And so I'm looking forward to it. Uh, looking forward to working with all, everyone here and staff. Uh, again, I'm going to reiterate that tonight is National Law Enforcement Appreciation Day, and uh, that is a national uh, effort and certainly well deserved. But uh, I'm not going to repeat all the events. I attended several of these things that people talked about, and uh, no sense going over them again. But it's it's been a good start to the year, and it was a great finish to the year. So, at that, I am going to turn it over to the city manager. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and, and I'll uh, speed through these. Uh, the city launched uh, brand new just this month the monthly digital newsletter. Uh, so please, uh, subscribers will receive a monthly newsletter in their email box uh, that includes information on city, project services, program, events, and more as part of the effort to keep uh, uh, outreach to our community. You can b visit beavercreekohio.gov uh, slash stay connected uh, to subscribe. So please do. Uh, we've already get gotten uh, a, a lot of hits on this. Uh, Citizens Police Academy has been mentioned, so again, nine weeks, starts uh, February 1st through uh, March 29th. Uh, on Wednesday evenings, classes from 6 to 9. Again, uh, please uh, visit the uh, website, beavercreekohio.gov slash Citizens Police Academy to find more uh, out about it and register. Uh, apply to be on a city board or commission. Uh, we are taking applications. There's a list. Uh, in February, the City Council will be appointing people for vacancies and, and the people whose terms have expired uh, to these boards and commissions. So if you're interested in looking at what's available, uh, beavercreekohio.gov uh, slash boards and commissions. I uh, failed to mention the holiday coming up, Martin Luther King Day, uh, Junior Day, uh, on uh, Coming up on this following Monday, January 16th, so City Hall and the Senior Center will be closed in observance for the holiday. As always, non-emergencies, uh, please contact Beaver Creek Police Department, 937-426-1225. And I uh, just want to remind uh, the audience, normally we would be here on January 16th on the holiday, but since that is a holiday, our work session will be on Tuesday, January 17th, at 5 p.m., same place, same bat channel, just different day. And that's all I have tonight. All right, thank you. Next on the agenda is citizen comments. And this is the time when anybody can come up and address council on any issue at all. And we limit comments to three minutes, or you can have the time donated up to nine minutes. So is there anyone here tonight that would like to address council on any issue at all? Please come up. Give us a name and address, please. Uh, name, Talis Netsaru. Address 132, Miami's Bird, 45342. Just moved from Miami's Bird, so I kind of... <laughs> um, so my issue is, or the thing that I want to speak to you all about is, uh, of course, John Crawford. That's the only reason I'm here, honestly. Uh, I'm pretty sure you all all know the story about John Crawford III. Because uh, we've we've done work at Walmart, uh, at the mall. We did a uh, event up there also. But um, I was here. But I'm here because I want to speak to you all about the street. What street is that? That's in front of Beaver Creek Walmart, between the street. I mean, between Walmart and the mall. That street. That's Pentagon. Pentagon. Right. Uh, why not change that street name to John Crawford the Third? Why not change that name to John Crawford III? I mean, we talked about setting, a, setting an example for the kids in the future. I heard a lot of great things about this police department and about Beaver Creek. And that would be a great thing for the city of Beaver Creek to do on behalf of this young man that was 
honestly murdered by two officers who received no punishment to our knowledge, the, the people's knowledge. And to my knowledge, they're still on the force and nothing happened. And the least, the least, the least that you all can do is consider or please implement his name instead of Pentagon Highway, pay tribute. Because what happened was pretty unfortunate. It could have been me. Uh, the mother and father of this young man have to deal with this every day. It's unfortunate that it happens as often as it does. So I'm just saying consider that. Um, it's just me today. Um, and I'm not trying to cause any ruckus here. I'm great at that. I've done that. You have all may have seen me but didn't know it was me. Uh, out front of Beaver Creek uh, Walmart, out front of... Uh, or inside the uh, store of Walmart, actually, uh, and also at the mall as well uh, on December 30th or the 29th, I can't remember. I've done a lot in six years. And also, uh, uh, with that academy I heard of, somebody here mentioned a police academy? Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, at that academy, is there a way that we can see what's being taught to these officers or what's being shown to them? This is a citizen, we, well, I'm, I don't want to get into that because we're not supposed to interact at this point. Okay. But yes, so, well, I'll answer, be happy to answer that question for you, though. Okay, sure. So I was, I mean, the reason I say that is because uh, what happened to John Crawford was, was unfortunate, and it was a few things that could have prevented that. Uh, if, if the officers would have came in and spoke and said, uh, who is this guy, or put it down, if he would have heard, I'm pretty sure he'd say, oh, I didn't know it was as serious as fate. Calm down, please. It's okay. You know, uh, they, it's, it's a lot of things that could have happened before they just came in. That's one of the quickest murders by officers in history. I don't know if you all looked it up, but I definitely did. The only one that comes quicker than that is Tamir Rice, who was 12 years old, and it happened on December 23rd, same year. Hmm. It's unfortunate. So I'm asking today if we can honor his family and this boy who was a young man at the time, a father of two. If we could turn that street name into John Crawford III, that's all I have for today. Thank you. Thank you for your input. Anyone else have want to address council? I don't know if I. My name is Shirley Schultz, 2906 Dayton Senior Road, Beaver Creek, Ohio. I don't know if I can do this or not. Um, a dear friend passed away on January 2nd, and he was somebody who really did a lot for Beaver Creek. His name's Rex Molinex. Rex was 98 years old. He was in World War II as a top turret gunner, and he served his country as a very young person, and he came home after shooting, being credited with shooting down a German jet as a top turret gunner. We moved in next to his house 40 some years ago. Rex went to Ohio University, then he returned to the Air Force as an officer. He was connected with the um, Dockery Realty here in Beaver Creek. He and his wife were very active in the historical society and living 98 years old, still knowing what was going on just impressed me. And I attended his funeral Saturday Tobias recognized him very nice, as did his family. And if you're interested, on the Tobias website, you can read about Rex Molinex and the wonderful things he did. Thank you. Thank you. You got through it just fine. And if, if you will indulge me just one second, I'm going to, on that note, uh, I think most of you probably do know that Evelyn Dunnigan also passed. And uh, her service, her viewing and service was this past week. Uh, but she is the wife of Paul Dunnigan, the, I believe he was the first mayor of the city, not the first mayor. He had a hardware store. But anyway, uh, for those of you that didn't know that she had passed, I just wanted to pass it on. Is there anyone else tonight that would like to address council on any issue whatsoever? Seeing none, we will move on. I believe we're next is the an executive session. 
Uh, I have a motion, please. Mayor, I move to enter into executive session pursuant to section 121.22 of the Ohio Revised Code for the purpose of consideration of the sale of property. All right, thank you. Is there a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. May we have a roll call, please? I did. Council Member Dewar. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Council Member Schwartz. Yes. Council Member Dewar. Yes. Council Member Bales. Yes. Council Member Kern. Yes. Council Member Adams. Yes. Mayor Stone. Yes. And for the sake of the televised audience and those in the room, there will be no decisions or action taken on this executive session. So the televised portion will end. However, we will reconvene here uh, to close out the regular session of the meeting. So with that, we are in executive session. <laughs>